This is a site which is very familiar to all of us. Shells full of aerosol cans containing a whole variety of products. Deodorants, hairsprays, cleaning agents, or paints like these. Now, until the late 1970s, the most commonly used propellants for these aerosol sprays were compounds called chlorofluorocarbons, or fluorocarbons for short. But in 1974, two chemists working here in the United States recognized that these very unreactive compounds accumulate in the atmosphere and could lead to a decrease in the amount of ozone in the stratosphere. As a result of their work, the use of fluorocarbons as propellants in aerosols has been phased out in the United States. And now, if you buy an aerosol can in the US, it has on it a statement like this. Ozone safe, does not contain fluorocarbons. Seen from space, the Earth's atmosphere shrouds the planet like a thin mist. Lying within the stratosphere, the Earth's upper atmosphere between about 10 and 50 kilometers high, is the so-called ozone layer. Representing at most no more than a millionth part of the stratosphere, ozone filters out much of the sun's harmful ultraviolet radiation. The prediction made in 1974 was that fluorocarbons released from aerosols and other sources could reduce the amount of ozone in the stratosphere. The result would be an increase in the amount of harmful UV radiation reaching the Earth's surface, with potentially catastrophic results. Some important food crops, such as corn and sugar beet, are highly sensitive to increased amounts of ultraviolet light. An increase in UV could result in a decrease in world food production. Certain small marine organisms and fish larvae also seem to have a low tolerance to UV. Once again, an increase in ultraviolet could reduce productivity in the oceans. And perhaps the most emotive topic of all, cancer. There's a strong link between a fatal type of skin cancer called melanoma and exposure to ultraviolet light. Any increase in UV could result in an increase in the number of deaths from skin cancer. The threat to the ozone layer by fluorocarbons and the consequences of increased UV at ground level resulted in a well-publicized debate during the mid-1970s. Even though the case was overstated at times, it did result in a rapid response by the US government. Fluorocarbon-11, used mostly in aerosols, has been produced in steadily increasing quantities since the 1950s. Fluorocarbon-12 is used as a cooling agent in refrigerators and also as a blowing agent in the manufacture of insulation foam. Only by banning the use of fluorocarbons, especially in aerosols, could the escalating use of these gases be checked. No action, the Americans argued, could result in a world disaster. Yet in Europe, the reaction was very different. Government agencies tended to take a wait-and-see attitude, preferring to carry out more research before taking action. So, why this different approach to the problem? And why is the controversy still continuing after all this time? The scientific discussion began with this issue of Nature, published in June 1974. It was in this paper that the two American scientists, Rowland and Molina, proposed their theory that fluorocarbons can destroy ozone in the stratosphere. Up until that time, fluorocarbons seemed the perfect propellants for aerosols. They're odorless and they're not inflammable. But it's because of their highly inert properties that fluorocarbons pose a threat. In their paper, Rowland and Molina proposed that virtually all the fluorocarbons ever released were still in the lower atmosphere, the troposphere. Fluorocarbons aren't soluble in water, so they're not washed out of the atmosphere by rain, and they won't dissolve in the oceans. 
the only place for them to go is upwards, a slow diffusion over many years or even decades into the stratosphere. Ozone in the stratosphere is produced from diatomic oxygen by the action of sunlight. The single oxygen atoms released then combine with oxygen molecules to produce ozone O3. The production of ozone is balanced by natural processes of destruction, such as the photolysis of ozone to give back an oxygen atom and an oxygen molecule. But Rowland and Molina proposed an additional destruction process. Fluorocarbons diffusing upwards into the stratosphere would break down under the action of sunlight to release a free chlorine atom. This free chlorine can then react with ozone to produce a ClO radical plus diatomic oxygen. The ClO radical can then react with a free oxygen atom to produce diatomic oxygen, so releasing atomic chlorine which is then free to react with another molecule of ozone. So, for each complete cycle, one O3 molecule and one oxygen atom are removed, with the chlorine atom being regenerated each time. This catalytic chain means that a very small concentration of free chlorine atoms can have an enormous multiplying effect in removing stratospheric ozone. Although no one doubts that this reaction occurs in the laboratory, there's no proof that it's a significant process in the stratosphere. What's more, as Roland and Molina pointed out in their paper, it would take many years before any ozone depletion could be detected because of the slow diffusion of fluorocarbons into the stratosphere. But how can their hypothesis be checked? If their initial proposition is correct, that slow diffusion into the stratosphere is the only way for fluorocarbons to be removed from the troposphere, then measurements of their concentrations in the troposphere ought to match the well-documented release rates over the same period. The concentration of fluorocarbons in the troposphere is very low, less than one part in 10 to the 9. And that's a very low concentration indeed. Let me give you an analogy. That dilution is equivalent to just three drops of dye in a swimming pool this size. Measuring the concentration of fluorocarbons in the troposphere is then equivalent to measuring the concentration of dye in the water. The technique used to measure such low concentrations is gas chromatography, used by researchers such as graduate student Stanley Tyler working in Professor Rowland's laboratory at the University of California, Irvine. To measure fluorocarbon concentrations, the canister containing the air sample is attached to a vacuum line and then cooled to freeze out any water that may be present. After about 20 minutes, the air sample from the canister is allowed to expand into an evacuated sample loop. The amount of air sample taken is known from the volume of the loop and the pressure in the system. Different researchers use slightly different procedures. In this case, the sample is flushed through a pre-concentrator, a short column inside the gas chromatograph cooled to minus 40 degrees centigrade. This condenses out the fluorocarbons but lets the other components escape. The oven temperature is then raised to 150 degrees centigrade to ensure that all the fluorocarbons pass onto the separation column. The sample is flushed onto the separation column by ultra-pure argon. As they come off the column, the fluorocarbons are measured by an electron capture detector. These detectors are particularly sensitive to compounds containing halogen atoms. The first compound to come off is fluorocarbon-12, CF2Cl2. And the peak coming off now 
is fluorocarbon-11, CF, CL3. The blips on the trace are the recorder automatically changing sensitivity. Although the first peak is smaller, this actually corresponds to a greater amount of fluorocarbon-12, because the detector isn't equally sensitive to both compounds. The samples are taken from a variety of locations worldwide. For example, if I wanted a sample of early evening air from an urban site, then here, high above Los Angeles, I could be pretty certain that the sample would be well mixed and therefore representative. The samples are collected in canisters like these, made of stainless steel. All I need to do is simply open it to the atmosphere. Samples have been collected in these canisters all over North and South America by Stanley Tyler. Patagonia, Peru, the Amazon, even the odd Pacific island. Never let a research chemist tell you it's a hard life. From samples taken during 1979, Stanley Tyler has constructed a north-south profile of fluorocarbon concentrations in the troposphere. Not surprisingly, it shows higher levels in the northern hemisphere where most aerosols are used. Eight years previously, during the winter of 1971, a British scientist, Professor James Lovelock, took similar measurements of fluorocarbon concentrations from a research ship on its way to the Antarctic. The patterns are very similar, but Tyler's 1979 data, taken eight years later than the first measurements, show a very significant increase of about 200% in the concentration of fluorocarbons in the troposphere. This increase is almost exactly equal to the total amount released to the atmosphere between 1971 and 1979. This then confirms Roland and Molina's proposition that fluorocarbons cannot be removed from the troposphere except by slow diffusion into the stratosphere. So, this huge reservoir of fluorocarbons in the troposphere represents an enormous source of chlorine atoms to drive the catalytic cycle of ozone destruction. Well, there seems little doubt that chlorine atoms from chlorofluorocarbons could indeed destroy stratospheric ozone. The question is, how significant is this process compared with other natural processes which remove ozone? The first step in answering this question is to calculate the expected reduction in ozone concentration due to the chlorofluorocarbons. And for this, we need to construct a computer model of the atmosphere. This requires the input of such data as solar irradiance and uh, transport phenomena. In addition, to describe the chemistry, we need to know the rate at which the various reactions occur. So, we need to measure the rate constants for all reactions thought to be of importance perhaps as many as 160 of them. One way of determining the rates of these very fast reactions is to use the discharge flow technique. In this experiment, we're measuring the rate constant for the all-important reaction between a chlorine atom and an ozone molecule. In principle, the technique is very simple. The chlorine atoms are mixed with ozone in a horizontal glass tube called the flow tube. Providing the speed of the gas flow through the flow tube is known, then the distance between the injection point of ozone and the point of measurement is proportional to time. Pure ozone is very unstable, so it's stored by adsorption on silica gel at very low temperatures minus 78 degrees centigrade. The ozone is swept into the flow tube by an inert carrier gas such as helium and its concentration is measured using ultraviolet absorption at 254 nanometers. Chlorine atoms are produced from chlorine molecules by a microwave discharge, hence the name discharge flow technique. A very dilute mixture of about 10 parts per million of chlorine and helium is used. 
The two gases are mixed inside the flow tube. Chlorine in the outer tube, ozone in the inner tube. The inner tube can move inside the main flow tube. This alters the point of injection and hence the time allowed for reaction. At the far end of the flow tube, a resonance fluorescence detector is used to measure the composition of the gas mixture. A discharge lamp containing chlorine in argon is used as a light source, so the emitted light contains lines characteristic of chlorine atoms. The chlorine atoms in the gas mixture that have not reacted with the ozone absorb this light and re-emit it as fluorescence. Unlike molecules, atoms emit the same wavelength of light that they absorb. That's why it's called resonance fluorescence. Once we have the necessary data, such as the various rate constants and their temperature dependence, it's possible in principle to predict the ozone concentration at various times in the future. The atmospheric models used are similar to those used for weather forecasting. These meteorological models allow variations in three dimensions, height, latitude, and longitude. But weather forecast models don't include any chemistry. If you want to include all the relevant reactions, even the fastest computers in the world limit you to variations in a single dimension. That means you can calculate the variation in ozone concentration with height, but only at one particular latitude and longitude, a so-called one-dimensional model. But we know that ozone concentration varies not only with height, but also with latitude. And so to be at all realistic, we need a two-dimensional model. However, this means that the number of reactions must be cut to 60, otherwise the computer can't cope. One of the most successful two-dimensional models has been developed here in Oxford University by Dr. John Pyle. The model works by taking an initial set of ozone concentrations in the atmosphere and calculating the changes produced over a period of one day by chemical reactions and atmospheric motions. It then repeats the calculations a day at a time to predict the ozone concentrations up to the turn of the century. The contours on this profile represent different ozone concentrations plotted against latitude horizontally and height in kilometers vertically. This is a typical pattern with maximum concentrations towards the north and south poles at a height of about 20 kilometers. The effect of fluorocarbons on stratospheric ozone is calculated by carrying out two computer runs in parallel. One which includes diffusion of fluorocarbons into the stratosphere and the other which doesn't. The difference between the two runs produces a diagram like this, which shows the predicted depletion of total ozone for the year 1992. This time, latitude is plotted vertically with time in months along the bottom. Minimum depletion occurs along the equator and increases to a maximum at the North Pole in April and at the South Pole in September. Well, the present observed ozone concentrations agree well with those of the model. But to test the accuracy of the predicted decline in ozone concentration is much more difficult, since it amounts at the present time to a fall in concentration of less than 1%. However, there's an alternative method of testing the accuracy of the model, and that is to compare the concentration of reaction intermediates, such as chlorine atoms or chlorine oxide radicals, predicted from the model with those measured in the stratosphere. To make these measurements, we need to send sensitive instruments into the stratosphere, and the cheapest way of doing this is to use a balloon. All high-altitude balloons in the United States are launched from the National Scientific Balloon Facility in Texas. The instrument package and its associated parachute is attached to the balloon, which is then inflated with helium.
When the balloon eventually reaches a height of about 40 kilometers, near the top of the stratosphere, the instrument package and its parachute are released. The method used to measure the intermediate reactants, such as chlorine atoms and CLO, is essentially a development of the discharge flow technique. As the capsule descends, the atmospheric gases flow past the instruments in the package. Resonance fluorescence is used to measure the reactive intermediates. To measure chlorine atoms, the same type of chlorine atom discharge lamp is used as in the discharge flow experiment. To measure CLO concentrations, the radicals are first converted to chlorine atoms by reaction with nitric oxide, and then measured in the same way. That way, chlorine atom and CLO concentrations can be measured alternately in the same experiment. The results of these balloon experiments compare reasonably well with the predictions of the computer model developed by John Pyle. In this example, the chlorine atom to CLO ratio is plotted against height in the stratosphere. The value of this ratio, at about 40 kilometers, matches the predicted value well. Unfortunately, by their very nature, these balloon measurements only relate to a small part of the atmosphere at a particular time. But are they representative values or just local variations? Do they support Molina and Rowland's hypothesis or not? Should we trust models or experiment? Well, of course, all hypotheses must be tested by experiment. The problem is, there's no way of testing this particular hypothesis except by waiting to see what happens in the stratosphere over the next 10 or 20 years. But if we do wait for an observed decrease in ozone concentrations, then it could be too late. Because of steadily increasing concentrations of fluorocarbons in the troposphere, we'd be committed to a much greater decrease in ozone concentration over the next 50 or 100 years. So, the controversy remains unresolved, there are strong opinions on each side, and there's no easy answer. In a sense, the whole issue arose through measurements made using homemade apparatus by one man, someone who was involved in the fluorocarbon issue even before the 1974 paper in Nature. He lives and works here in the wilds of Devon, Professor Jim Lovelock. In the early 1950s, Jim Lovelock, then working for the Medical Research Council, needed a more sensitive gas chromatography detector than those available at that time. So he invented one, the electron capture detector. It soon became apparent that this new type of detector was unusually sensitive to compounds containing halogen atoms. It was this very high sensitivity that enabled him some years later, quite by chance, to discover and to measure the concentrations of fluorocarbons in the atmosphere. To find the source of these compounds, he set sail in November 1971 aboard the research ship Shackleton, bound for the Antarctic, equipped with his homemade chromatograph to measure the global concentrations of fluorocarbons. The results that were produced during the Shackleton voyage provided the basis for the molina Rowland hypothesis. And my first reactions on reading their, their paper was A, that it was an extremely interesting and probably important hypothesis, and B, a certain concern that they seemed unaware that I'd measured chlorofluorocarbons because of their use as tracers and had ignored the presence of other halocarbons in the air, which they didn't know about, but which I strongly suspected were probably there. The United States' reaction to Molina and Rowland's work, we felt in Europe, was rather hasty. It became a political issue rapidly, and as you know, legislation was soon passed. 
One of the problems with banning fluorocarbons is that they are amongst the safest and most harmless of chemicals that are ever brought into the home. They're non-inflammable, non-toxic. Uh, you could almost bath your baby in them without fear uh, of harm. And all substitutes do have some uh, rather unfortunate drawback. Hydrocarbons are one substitute. Well, as everybody knows, they're flammable. Refrigerants such as ammonia and sulfur dioxide, which could be substitutes, are highly toxic. And it's this kind of problem. You exchange a remote danger of possible uh, UV damage in the future for an immediate danger of substances which are hazardous in the home. For various reasons, we in Europe uh, preferred to, to take a slower course, uh, partly because we, we did have the facilities for modelling the atmosphere, mostly at the Meteorological Office in Britain, which suggested to us that the affairs in the stratosphere didn't necessarily affect the whole of the atmosphere in the rather simplistic way that uh, uh, was the basis of the American legislation. As time has passed, and the complexity of just the stratosphere alone has been revealed, by investigation, so the predicted depletion has steadily decreased over the course of time. One of the more recent models of the stratosphere, that by the Oxford group, uh, John Piles, suggests an ozone depletion somewhere in the next century in the region between 5 and 10 percent. Of course, the depletion will be greater over the poles than it is over the equator, so that from the point of view of people at the surface, one should always bear this in mind. There are many sources of ozone in the atmosphere, in addition to the ozone which is produced in the stratosphere directly by the absorption of solar ultraviolet light. For example, the release of methane by bacterial action from the soils. And a vast quantity of this gas is produced, something like a thousand million tons a year. Its oxidation in the atmosphere produces ozone. High-flying commercial jet aircraft all produce oxides of nitrogen in their exhausts. And at the levels of the atmosphere where they fly, the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere, these produce ozone. All of these sum up so that for a man standing on the ground somewhere in the sunshine, what matters to him is how much ozone there is between him and the sun. And it doesn't matter where it is, whether it's in the troposphere or the stratosphere.